Okay, now we're going to talk about chapter 25, which covers the, um, the origins of life uh, on planet Earth. And um, so we've already covered this in the previous chapter, macroevolution, long-term changes in, in uh, organisms leading to speciation. Um, but here again, we're going to talk about sort of the origins of the first living things. And it starts with the famous, Miller, famous Miller-Urey experiments in which... Um, they were able to synthesize simple organic molecules from uh, simpler inorganic molecules under the right conditions. And then once you have those simple organic molecules, you can make larger organic molecules. Um, some from amino acids, you can make proteins. And from basic fatty acids, you can make lipids, for example. And so the presumed um, origin or pattern in which these, these, this, pa this process occurred, again, was the formation of these organic molecules and the formation of what we would call a protobiont, a sort of early type of living thing, you might say. <clears throat> and so what these protobionts have is they have basically consist of a uh, lipid ball. And that lipid ball begins to have a certain chemistry inside of it, certain processes going on that's different from the outside. And as shown here, it starts to exhibit a simple kind of heret uh, metabolism. Now, in addition, uh, you'd have to have some sort of way of passing on information, and so that's the development of heredity. And it's thought that RNA was the first hereditary material which, of course, eventually led to DNA. And so you have this early s simple cell-like structure with a metabolism, with a heredity. And if it splits in two, it starts to exhibit reproduction. And so you, you begin to get the characteristics of a living thing. Now, where do we go to find, uh, of course, a record of life on Earth? You go to the fossil record, which, you've, as you've learned back in middle school, you find fossils in sedimentary rock. And um, using radioactive isotopes, you can date these fossils using the half-life, which you'll remember from uh, freshman year, in which over, when you have a particular amount of radioactive isotope in a uh, sample, over one half-life, you will lose half of the radioactive isotope. In another half-life, you'll lose half of that, so you'll now only have three-quarters remaining. And then over another half-life, you'll lose half what was there, and you'll only have one-eighth remaining, etc. And so you can use this technique to, again, date things that are quite old, like dimetrodon. I just put dimetrodon on here because I like the name dimetrodon. All right, so what are some of the key events in life's history? Well, we can think of it as a clock. And uh, we'll look at uh, these different parts as we move along here. But, of course, we get the origin of, of uh, the solar system and planet Earth. And so it's more or less four and a half to five billion years old, as far as we can tell. And so we see here the first living things at about three and three quarter billion years ago, the first evidence of prokaryotes, which actually there are apparently fossils of prokaryotes. Here's some of these pictures, these squiggly things that they get out of these rocks that are thought to resemble or are thought to be the fossils of the first <clears throat> uh, living things, the first prokaryotes. And then um, some of these early prokaryotes start to photosynthesize. Um, about 2.7 billion years ago, and this, of course, led to turning H2O, the oxygen in H2O, into O2, which before this time, there was no free oxygen gas on the planet. And so this changed the planet a great deal, particularly the atmosphere, and um, led from a reducing planet, a reducing atmosphere, to an oxidizing atmosphere, one full of oxygen that could oxidize lots of things. How do we know this happened about 2.7 billion years ago? They see changes in the rocks where you start to basically see rocks that are oxidized or that rusting occurs in these rocks. All right, now, so we still have a prokaryotic world, but now we start to get 
increasing complexity in these prokaryotes in which they start to have an internal membrane system increasing the surface area of the membranes inside them giving them certain advantages whether it comes to respiration or photosynthesis and then we now get the engulfing of a smaller prokaryote by a larger one the smaller one is very efficient at doing cellular respiration and this process is known as the endosymbiotic uh, theory in which one organism becomes an endosymbiont in another begins living there and then eventually becomes part of that organism and that's how we're pretty sure mitochondria came about in the development of eukaryotes now a subset of these early eukaryotes with mitochondria also engulfed chloroplasts and now you get the development of algae and plants etc photosynthetic organisms from engulfing these photosynthetic bacteria long ago <clears throat> how do we know that mitochondria came first well what do you think when we look at the diversity of eukaryotes all eukaryotes have a mitochondria but only some have a pro have a, have a chloroplast so it's assumed that the mitochondrion must have come first and then again a subset of those eukaryotes engulfed the chloroplasts all right oops now you start to get development of multicellular organisms here are some algae and some unicellular algae but then others that live in colonial forms that really aren't so much true multicellularity but are starting to get there these are clusters of cells that are kind of all doing the the same thing but then we start to get the development of animals about 620 million years ago again some of these primitive ones the cnidarians or the sea anemones and jellyfish sponges and mollusks <clears throat> and then so that was about 620 so about 535 million years ago we have what's known as the Cambrian explosion in which the diversity of animal life in a relatively short period of time geologically speaking diversified a great deal in that the major phyla of animals we see now evolved at this point in time and this picture is supposed to come from these weird fossils that they find in this um, particular region of I believe it's in western Canada and it's called the Burgess Shale where they see a lot of these funky fossils um, so now with the advent of photosynthesis and the changing of the atmosphere with all this oxygen you get the development of the ozone layer high up in the atmosphere which now starts to block out UV light and makes the land more hospitable and so things begin to colonize land and you start to get development of plants and fungi and then also some of those early types of animals begin to colonize land so again here's that uh, order again first cells photosynthesis the endosymbiotic theory multicellularity increase in diversity of animals colonization of land and so that takes us way up to here um, <clears throat> all right some of the other processes that have impacted this of course continental drift in which um, at one point you had this sort of supercontinent Pangaea and it began to break up into separate uh, plates and moved around to different parts of the planet further north away from the equator and so now you started to get land that was found in um, cooler parts of the world and we also see when we look at the geologic record and the fossils there are these mass extinctions periods in earth's history when the number of types of, of plants and animals dis decrease significantly and so here the number of uh, this is looking at animals in particular and so this is groups families of animals and so you start to see again the first ones long ago and rapidly increasing but then you see these periods these little blips where you get these drops here's a really big one right here and so here's the one that led to the demise of the dinosaurs and the dotted lines here are ones that could potentially represent uh, extinctions occurring now due to human activities 
So what causes these? Well, as these tectonic plates move around again, it can lead to significant changes in the climate that organisms are exposed to. Um, and that could cause some to, again, not be able to make it through. Uh, as we know, you probably know with dinosaurs, it's hypothesized that a large meteorite hit the planet and changed the world, changed the climate significantly, and the dinosaurs couldn't, couldn't hack it, but it allowed the mammals to uh, diversify rapidly. Okay, again, we're looking at the fossil record. And after these mass extinctions, again, geologically speaking, it doesn't take long for diversity to um, sort of bounce back. Although this one right here, the Permian extinction, again, was a big one, and it did take a while for diversity to get back up. <clears throat> All right, what helps to increase this diversity? Well, this is what um, is known as the process adaptive radiation, which is something that Darwin studied in which you have a single ancestral species that is able to give rise to several new species as subpopulations of that original species spread out or living in new, um, new environments and um, change significantly enough to become um, new types of species. What we, what we saw in the previous chapter was called allopatric speciation. And Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Island are a good example of this, where whoops, where it's thought, again, there was an ancestral species that came from the mainland when the Galapagos were forming, but then they, they spread out to the different islands <clears throat> and evolved in different ways. All right, um, other things that can influence the evolution of species, heterochrony. This is when you get a change in the rate of development. So, for example, within salamanders, you tend to see these um, sort of distinct fingers forming, and that's sort of the perhaps more evolved state. But then you have some species that those fingers don't develop nearly as much, so they have a different rate of development. Um, and this leads to what we can call allometric growth as well. And allometric growth is when um, the parts, if you will, of an organism grow at different rate. And people exhibit this quite nice. When you look at it, these, obviously, are not to scale. We don't have a giant baby here. But as you can see, babies are about one-fourth head. Okay, But as an individual grows, your head does indeed get bigger, but not nearly as much as the rest of your body. So your arms and your legs grow at a faster rate than your head. And so again, this is what's called allometric growth, where you've got differential growth rates for different body parts. And so when you have this um, retention of gen juvenile traits, this is known as pedamorphosis. Um, so we would say this one right here is sort of pedamorphic. It's exhibiting more juvenile traits. And so here's a type of salamander that salamanders typically live outside of land when they're adults. But this is one that as an adult stays in water and has these external gills. This would be a pedomorphic trait. Um, and so this is also known as neoteny when you're retaining these juvenile traits in sexually mature individuals. And certain dogs have been bred to look like this, these sort of dogs with flat faces. That's a, a more juvenile trait than the typical adult trait you see in a dog where they have an elongated snout. <clears throat> And here's another example whoop, up here with, with humans. Uh, what else? Also, um, genes obviously play a big role in this. And so you can get the evolution of genes, particularly genes that influence body form. These homeotic genes, which I think we've seen that term before. Um, duplication of these from um, insects to mammals. And mammals have many f copies of these. And so that's allowed for a different type of development in them. And one thing to keep in mind is that evolution is not goal-oriented. The development of a complex eye was not necessarily the goal of evolution, if you will, because, again, there is no goal, but it's a structure that evolved because of natural selection giving organisms some sort of advantage. And this is shown nicely as well in this uh, family tree of the horses, in which you can see some types didn't make it. They went extinct. But if we had played it this backwards, there's no reason why this one wouldn't have survived and the current horse 
would have died out if things had been slightly different. And I have run out of time. Thank you.